Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. We'd all love to hit skip on our problems now and again. But using wheat to deal with stress as a teen won't make your issues go away. That's because THC messes with parts of the brain responsible for fear and anxiety, making it even harder to manage them on your own. So even the smaller things can start to feel difficult to handle. Learn better ways to deal with stress at mindovermarijuana.com. That's mindovermarijuana.com. Sponsored by the California Department of Public Health. Hello world, you're listening to Strategicon, your window to all things security and foreign affairs. It is Friday, October the 21st, 2016, episode 18. For today's topic, we'll be joined by Strategicon co-host and SIA's resident existentialist philosopher, David Olney. Hello, David. Greetings, John, and hello, audience. Before we get started on today's episode, I would like to remind listeners that Strategicon can be found on iTunes as well as a link to our podcast on the Sage International Australia website, www.sageinternational.org.au. This week, we saw the Iraqi government offensive to retake the ISIL-occupied city of Mosul. As an analyst, I have to say that the timing of the offensive came as a surprise, considering a number of factors. Firstly, the Iraqi army has had some victories of late with the liberation of Ramadi and Fallujah from ISIL occupation, but these victories had more to do with the application of US air power in conjunction with the use of Shiite militias, militias with a reputation for brutality only eclipsed by ISIL fighters. Secondly, Ramadi and Fallujah are small towns in comparison to Mosul, which is a major Iraqi city and has a population of around one million people. One would have thought that encircling the city first and probing ISIL's defences, coupled to a concerted psychological operation aimed at demoralising ISIL defenders and mobilising Mosul's population to rise up against their occupiers, would have been more logical. Thirdly, To me, this operation began in haste, even though it has been ongoing since March 2016, possibly as Obama's last hurrah before he becomes just another footnote in American political history. Or perhaps he set a trap for one-time political rival Hillary Clinton, the presidential candidate who seems most likely to win the US presidential election come November 8. 
After all, it will be her who has to help Baghdad clean up the mess should local forces come unstuck in capturing this large Iraqi city. Hypothetically, any large-scale Iraqi army or Shiite militia abuses of locals in Mosul will pose a significant crisis for Clinton. It might even give more strategic space to Russian President Vladimir Putin, a person likely to be on a collision course with Clinton should Clinton become the new US president. Lastly, it is entirely possible that Obama received actionable intelligence that Mosul is ripe for the taking and has chosen his time to move the Iraqi government on this matter with deliberation. Nonetheless, considering the likelihood that Iraqi government forces have not been adequately trained for such a massive endeavor gives one pause for thought that this major military action may well turn into a significant quagmire. Your thoughts, David? Can I please have time to dig a deep bunker? Sure. <laughs> as deep as you like to go. Okay, on the deep bunker scenario, let's start with major battles related to cities we know about in Iraq. Let's go back to the two battles of Fallujah. You know, Marines in Battle 1 could have taken the city, told to stop when it became clear that too many civilians were dying. Battle 2, Marines plus Army take Fallujah away from Al-Qaeda in Iraq at a cost from memory of 20% of buildings in the city being destroyed, 50% of buildings in the city being severely damaged. And that was Fallujah, a small-ish Sunni city where most of the population had fled before the battle, where encirclement was relatively easy and where the entire operation was done by very well-trained and fresh American troops. So if we view Fallujah as a best-case scenario, please let me dig a very deep bunker. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The Battle of Mosul sees an Iraqi army of some 20,000 strong fighting alongside 10,000 Iraqi Kurdish Peshmerga militias. At this stage, we haven't heard too much of the deployment of Shiite militias, though we know they are part of the Iraqi order of battle. Do you think this has been kept quiet so as not to spook the population of Mosul? Maybe not just so it doesn't spook them, but maybe also because if it's Shia Muslims coming at the wall, IS get better propaganda value. It's just too convenient for them if the principal people they're fighting aren't Sunni Muslims for them to go, look, you know, we are here, the real version of Islam. You know, it's terrible, but their propaganda is so good, you would have to expect that it's less a case that the Iraqi government can do without the Shia militias than they don't want to give ISIL any more propaganda opportunities than they've already had. This campaign to liberate Mosul from Islamic State rule will be a campaign where the rules of war, rules that have been fraying internationally over recent years, will be thrown out the window. Mosul is the jewel in the crown for Islamic State. Only Raqqa and Syria, where ISIL has its headquarters, is of greater strategic importance. There are already rumours circulating that ISIL fighters will attempt to turn a greater part of the population of Mosul into human shields. Civilians fleeing the city have already been killed by Islamic State occupiers. The size of Mosul offers ISIL some strategic depth, and while they are most certainly outnumbered by attacking Iraqi government forces and their Kurdish allies, a defence in depth using IEDs, suicide bombings, booby traps, and house-to-house -house fighting promises to make this a gruelling campaign. After all, ISIL has had two years to prepare for the defence of Mosul. Do you think that the Iraqis are able to prosecute this battle and, importantly, acquit themselves well in this battle? Okay, I think there's two things there. First of all, let's look at recent sieges. Let's look at Aleppo. Aleppo wasn't meant to go on to be a long-term siege, and yet with everyone not prepared for a siege, it has still gone on to be disastrous for everybody involved. On the basis that ISIL have been learning valuable lessons about how to run a siege from Aleppo, how many different ways you can slow down an attack. Um, we'd have to assume that Mosul could be a multi-year siege and that with the ability to hide behind a captured population, it becomes a street-by-street, house-by-house infantry bug hunt 
because there's no capacity to use US air power. Mm. In that case, we have the very fragile and questionable Iraqi government throwing middling troops at best, Pashmurga, who are not really committed to the project other than potentially getting Mosul for themselves, Shia militias who want to exact a cost, at a city that's going, bring it on. Yeah. We make the retreat of the German army through Eastern Europe look wimpy. We're here for the three-year controlled defence in depth retreat. Yeah. Every block is another month of grief for the attacking forces. And based on the house that the Pashmurga found on Tuesday, which had a 100-metre tunnel under it full of food and medical supplies, if that's what two years can do in an outlying village, imagine if every block has that equivalent house so its defenders have a 100-metre tunnel full of food and medical supplies and ammo. How long this can drag on for? Should the campaign to liberate Mosul go better than expected, what are the likely implications for the government of Haider al-Abadi? Al-Abadi has had a very rocky track record in terms of providing non-sectarian governance for Iraq since he took office from the highly pro-Shiite and some have said pro-Iranian uh, Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki. Al-Abadi's government has been roundly criticised both at home and abroad for corruption and rule for elite interests, not for the interests of all Iraqis. The fall of Mosul to Iraqi forces may have some positive political implications for al-Abadi, but will that translate into making his government better at governance? You first. I don't think it's going to make an iota of difference, quite frankly. I think that al-Abadi is known to have a government that has already been under siege by its own population. I mean, hell, the, uh, um, the government in Baghdad has been stormed in the green zone uh, a couple of times by ordinary folks. So um, I, I would imagine that, look, it would be a great idea for them to capture Mosul in good order and try to at least put a great veneer over what they're going to be doing. But in actual fact, I, I just don't see them have the capacity to pull this stunt off. Uh, not without uh, Iranian al-Quds support, not without U.S. air power, not without a whole heap of other externalities, which of course are unknown factors in the in this in this campaign. We have to realize, uh, David, the guys who are trying to defend Mosul, these are you know real ideologues. They're committed to their cause to the point where they're not going to disappear, dissipate, run away from the battle. It's more than likely that they're going to actually stand and die where they are. It does look like it's going to be a long campaign, and, and as you rightly pointed out, I, I think that the quality of the Iraqi army is questionable, and I think that that in itself poses some significant problems in this campaign. Mm. You just, I think, captured a key thing, and that is the ISIL fighters in Mosul know exactly what they're standing for, but will the Iraqi government stand for anything or for anyone? Mm. They must attempt to retake you know, cities, space, land from ISIL. It's what a government needs to do to legitimise itself as a state. Yeah. But just because you have to do it doesn't mean you can do it or that you know what to do even if you have the dumb luck of winning. Well, that leads me to another question and that is so what's the use of a key military victory when the government prosecuting it is mistrusted by the people? I mean if the people of Iraq really want to reconstitute Iraq and the government is marching to a totally different beat. Even if they captured Mosul, what is the point? Welcome to the 21st century of war. Mm. You know, we're sitting here in Adelaide, South Australia, and what we've seen in the media this week is the uh, district governor responsible for the bit of Afghanistan the Australian troops used to be in saying, can you please come back? Mm. And can you please bring helicopter gunships? And can you please bring those boys from two commando? <laughs> Yeah. Because we're doing really bad and we need you back. So who's battle and for what purpose? Have we developed some sort of codependency relationship with the forces on the ground in countries like Iraq and Afghanistan? You know, we, we broke their systems, essentially. Um, not that their systems were any good prior to our, us intervening, but, you know, they at least had some form of control. But now they have no control. So 
Of course, they, they raise the red flag as soon as something happens and they can't seem to get a hold of the situation locally. And guess who they're going to call? They're going to call the West. They're going to call Australia. They're going to call the United States. They'll call Britain. They'll call the EU to bring in forces to help sort out local problems. Problems that we neither care for nor do we understand that much over. And that leads into this spiral of cataclysm, essentially, where it's, a, it's not only a clash of cultures, it's a clash of polities. It's, a, it, it's just a, an all-round clash. It's that terrible old comment from the retail world. You break it, you buy it. Yeah. We broke it, now we bought it. Yeah. And oh, at what cost to everyone involved? Again, it wasn't a prize, but now it's fragmented pieces. Mm. Yeah. Now, I wonder at some level if this operation had to go ahead now because, really, the Iraqi government is so desperate for credibility, it needed to act. But then the American government is pretty desperate for credibility as well. I mean, they, That's true. They, they, they've they taken a very light-on approach with Syria. They had invested so much blood and treasure, uh, treasure in Iraq, then they pulled out of Iraq. Now they're on the cusp of trying to land the big one on the Islamic State. If they mistimed this attack, if they are moving hastily, which I suspect that they are, then the repercussions for a dare I say, Clinton presidency is going to be quite significant internationally, wouldn't you think? That's very important. But let's go back one step to the fact, if it's going too early, what are the reasons for going too early locally? Mm. How much training can you provide to a military that doesn't seem to show a great deal of commitment? How much training can be provided to militias that you suspect will go off the reservation? Mm. If you planned for another six months and trained for another six months, are you essentially just building two incredible rival gangs to fight over the corpse? Yeah. You know, this has been raised about Afghanistan. Essentially, in training the Afghan National Army, have we simply trained and equipped the warlords who will end up running the joint? Not as a democratic government, but as the most lethal, most recently trained with the best kit team in town. You know, is the need to act now on Mosul both political necessity for the Iraqis military necessity in that any more training doesn't guarantee better outcomes mm. and potentially risks more capable people who could go off the reservation and act for the cause of sectarian uh, groups mm. and Obama's terms coming to its end and it's that thing of leaving a heritage I, at some level I think people are overstating his desperate need and desire to do something before he leaves I think it's far more likely to be the case he wants to do something that looks like we can have a positive outcome before he finishes with Syria turning into a quagmire mm. the desperate desire to try and get something done somewhere if the Battle of Mosul goes worse than expect, expected al Abadi may well have to face the music and pay a high political price do you think that that might spell the end of his prime ministership, or do you think that Iranian and American interests will keep him in power since there's no apparent successor to him? I think that critical thing is there's no apparent successor. Hmm. When there's no apparent successor, really, you just say the job was too big, the battle was too hard. You know, the idea with Mosul that potentially we have to wander at this point. ISIL have been losing ground across Iraq and Syria, it's reported that they've sent lots of Western fighters home to sit quietly and wait and unleash hell in the West. Is it time for the true believers within ISIL to pick a place, make a stand, and make this incredible point of martyrdom? Mm. Make this point where it is, we can't win, but we can forever say we don't accept your yoke. That would make ISIL's last stand or Islamic State's last stand something akin to a jihadist legend the stand of Mosul I mean that's going to have a major a major implication in terms of even if Islamic State gets wrapped up tomorrow the next generation of jihadis will always look to the battle of Mosul 
as their inspiration for further jihadist action against any Western interest that they see, right? Mm. The potential rallying cry in this seems amazing. Mm. So again, if we go back to where I started with the Battle of Fallujah, mm. you know, Al-Qaeda in Iraq put up a good fight, but it won them no long-term glory mm. because they fought, they lost, they left, they ran, they maintained the battle, and over time, Stan McChrystal and JSOC stomped them. But while that was happening, a certain proportion of people hid in the shadows and watched and learned. Mm. And these are the people that became the basis of ISIL. And they've now watched and learned once more. And to lose a siege and just lose, that can't happen twice. Humans ain't stupid. Mm. Humans are good at learning lessons about, oh, that didn't make us look good. And this is all about the long view, the long gain. It seems to me that this siege, the idea that you know we'll get kilometres of you know, approach to Mosul every day. Why? At a certain point, we start hitting defence in depth. And potentially, we hit thousands of people who will sacrifice the local population and have no intention of leaving alive. Because it's all about the legend they can build as inspiration for all the young Europeans they sent home, mm. who were told, look, you... You sit for three years before you do something. You, you're young. You sit for ten. Never forget what you're about to see and wait. This is a movement that understands the long view and they understand the fact that Al-Qaeda has fizzled since Osama bin Laden was killed in Abbottabad. Nothing much has happened. Al-Shabaab can do amazing single acts, create havoc, and not really get any strategic gains. The occasional tactical victory does not make up for strategic gridlock. This is about saying we can give you a million reasons to be afraid of the next generation of us. And it seems to me that that might be what this siege really ends up being about. Strategically, the battle for Mosul will draw the people's attention away from Aleppo in neighbouring Syria. As the media focuses on one key battle, do you think that fickle moral outrage will turn to Iraq, or is the international media sophisticated enough to walk and chew gum at the same time, monitoring both conflicts and providing them equal weight in terms of coverage? There seem to be so many media who are willing to be, you know, one grenade throw from the front line that will probably get equal footage of both. Mm. I'm less concerned with what the media see than what do the audience see? For the average person with their TV going in the background while they're eating dinner with the volume on low, they go, oh, looks like a siege. Looks like a car bomb. Oh, which place is that? I wonder if the distinction between the two has any relevance to people other than people like you and I who would do a podcast on it yeah. and people who would listen to our podcast. Mm-hmm. The media simply put it in front of the majority but I think it's probably only the minority who try and make sense of what's being put in front of us. Well, basically, it comes down to a term of, you know, uh, what's the difference between AFPAC and Sirac? You know, we're, yeah. we're talking about, you know, um, countries that come together in terms of their attractiveness for jihadist-related activity. Mm. You've seen it so often on TV that in the end you you end up just switching off thinking, well, it's a... You know, Central Asia, Middle East, it's a basket case. Who cares? Let's move on. Yeah, it just becomes the badlands where you don't want to go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, okay, David. Well, finally, it's been reported that tensions are running high between the Iraqi army and their Iraqi Kurdish allies, with Kurdish commanders claiming that the Iraqi army is moving at a glacial speed. Is it even possible that divisions between the largely Shiite-dominated Iraqi army and Kurdish militias might see the battle for Mosul end before it even really begins? And if so, how does this equation complicate America's grand strategy in its anti-ISIL drive? I would assume at the moment that the Kurds need to keep pushing because they're getting more pressure on them from Turkey so that they need to be seen to be very useful and very effective at the moment. But, you know, having spoken to several Kurds who've all agreed on the same thing, that Kurds will work together brilliantly when they're against the whole world, Mm. but the minute they've got some peace, they'll rip each other to pieces. So, really, I think what we're seeing here is everyone might find a good reason to get Mosul back, but once they get Mosul back, 
everyone is not likely to just fight with each other, but also to fight amongst themselves. Mm. Even the Shia militias aren't in total unison. There is certainly no continuity you know, amongst Sunni Arab Iraqi forces. Mm. And the Kurds, well, they have clear lines of division. What we essentially have is, let's get a city back so that we can then fight over the bits. When you, when you think of what's going on in Mosul and in Iraq generally, you tend to get a sense that unity among the so-called monolithic forces, you know, we talk about Kurds, we talk about Arabs, we talk about Shia, we talk about Sunni, you know, these are fictions, essentially. Because these particular groups, these monolithic groups that the press have made us aware of, don't exist in reality. Uh, Sunni Arabs are quite happy to sell each other out in order to move forward, as are Kurds, as are Shia. There is no monolithic bloc. And this is ultimately coming down to a central point about the Middle East and trying to get peace in this area. You can't get peace when groups are split into subgroups that are then split into subgroups that are then split into subgroups. And then on top of that, they play this, this game of the, enemies, uh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Mm. You know, you can't have it always. And the fact that these local contestants are thinking they can draw the West in and leverage off the West just makes us look, well, I don't know, gullible in a sense that somehow the West has superior firepower and by dint of that alone, we can actually impose our values, our culture, our politics onto an area of the world that isn't really truly receptive to all of this. I guess what it makes us look like is that we are either gullible, idealistic and or greedy for oil. And you can make a solid argument that we're all three and that really nothing has changed since the French and Brits drew an artificial map at the end of World War One, Yeah, that's true. You know, that's they drew a map that said, here's this place called Iraq, here's this place called Syria. Mm. They make no logical sense. They were causing problems by the 1920s. Yep. Hello? <laughs> well, you know, um, just because you happen to be in government doesn't necessarily mean that you're a student of history. And I think that we've seen that um, over the last few years. And recently, uh, some of the decisions that have been made uh, go against the grain for anyone like yourself, myself, our listeners, who know something about the region, who have taken the time and the interest to understand the region, you, you sit back and you wonder, well, where's the common sense in what is being put forward in terms of policy? Uh, there is no common sense. And I think that there's a, there's a major issue here. Uh, and, and we won't see stability in the Middle East until we actually can overcome this particular issue. Peace in the Middle East. Now there's an idea. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, on that note, thanks for listening to this episode. We hope that you'll join us for our next exciting adventure through the world of geopolitics. Remember that you can subscribe to Strate Strategicon through iTunes and please like us on the Sage International Australia Facebook site and follow us on Twitter. We're always looking to pass the most interesting information on international relations and security to our social media followers. And until next time, it's goodbye from me, John Bruni. And it's goodbye from me, David Olney. And remember, dig a deep bunker. Connect with your potential customers wherever they are. Effective uses Comcast viewership data insights to combine advanced targeting capabilities with premium TV and streaming content so you can deliver the best ad experiences to your audience no matter how they watch. Visit EFFECTV.com. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning OzCast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details.